I read an interesting article recently which contained research from The Economist that stated that in 2017, data became the most valuable resource in the world, beating out oil. And it also claimed that 97% of businesses use data to power their business opportunity. So the question then begged, what does data mean for businesses? Well, the answer was simple. It means, and I quote, now more than ever, being smart and careful with your data is the most crucial step in order to start turning a profit. So with that said, data is now officially the new oil and Snowflake, which is one of the most anticipated IPOs of 2020, happens to also be one of the biggest players in the world for collating and analyzing enormous amounts of data. And it's also not surprising that they have already drummed up interest with an early investment from the likes of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. So with that said, the objectives in today's video are to one, take a look at the company profile of Snowflake and try to gain a better understanding of how it works, the products and the services that they provide. Secondly, I also want us to dissect how they generate their revenues and spoiler alert, their revenue growth has been pretty incredible. And I've also discovered the secret for their growth, which I will reveal on their income statement. I also want us to take a look at their current customer clientele as Snowflake does boast some incredible names as customers. I also want to take a look at their current competition to establish whether Snowflake has a strong enough moat to last and we'll look through their current financials and lastly, try to answer the question, is Snowflake a buy at the OPO? And if it is, what are my plans with this stock? So all will be revealed in today's video. We have a ton of information that we need to get through, so please stay locked in. But right before we do jump in, don't forget to smash the like button as it really helps my channel grow. I did do a ton of research and I am sharing that with you today. And we are so close to 3K subs, so if you are new, hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with all my latest stock analysis and any major stock related news. So with that said, I appreciate your support and let's jump straight in. Right investors, so before we begin, all the information that I provide today can be found in the form S1 SEC filing made by Snowflake, um, I believe on the 8th of September 2020. So please access this form on the SEC website to ensure you do your own due diligence before you invest in this company. And also it's a way for you to fact check what I actually say in today's presentation. So I paid a lot of attention and read through the management discussion and analysis section, which is actually my favorite part. And I used all that information that I gathered from that section to compile today's presentation. So with that said, let's take a look at the company profile for Snowflake. So what's the story for Snowflake, ticker symbol S-N-O-W? So Snowflake, the best way I can describe it is simply a data warehouse company ecosystem that enables its customers and organizations to seamlessly normalize, share and unlock valuable data across a number of cloud platforms. And we'll go into further detail regarding the type of cloud platforms that they can work across. But for now, just know that they're able to normalize, collate, gather all that information across a number of different cloud platforms, okay? So, so essentially, Snowflake customers will be able to efficiently analyze and compare millions. And guys, when I talk about millions, they can quantify millions of data entries enabling more effective business decisions and conclusions in the hope to improve the company or the business's profitability because it's all about the top and bottom line, okay? The more data that a business has regarding their customers, the more they will be able to efficiently run their businesses. And of course, the goal is always to improve the top and the bottom line of your income statements, okay? So, with that said, what problem does Snowflake actually solve? Like, why is there so much hype surrounding this company? Yes, we understand what it does. It's a data warehouse, but what problem do they actually solve in this instance? And after digging deeper, I've found that the biggest problem that Snowflake solves are corporate and business silos, okay? So that's pretty much a large amount of corporate data that resides in a single cloud storage provider. 
So e.g. you have your a- Amazon's AWS, you know, you have your Microsoft Azuri, you also have your Google Cloud. Okay, so the problem with business silos is if you use one cloud storage provider, it's limited to just that one singular platform. For example, if you use the AWS, it's really difficult to transfer that data across to Microsoft Azure, for example. So that limits your data sharing possibilities across multiple cloud platforms. So Snowflake pretty much solves that problem. So Snowflake breaks down these limitations by unifying multiple cloud platforms which again will enable data sharing access to its users across all these platforms. So users will no longer have to log in to their Amazon AWS platform or their Microsoft Azure platform separately. All customers will have to do is log into their Snowflake account and that will link these platforms together. And you also get further support in the business critical package. So now we're talking about packages. Let me show you the different type of packages that Snowflake offers its clients. So as you can see, they have four different packages that they offer their customers, which include the standard package, which of course is always the entry level package and is the cheapest of all four packages. Then you have upgradable packages such as the enterprise, which of course includes all of the content from the standard package plus more. Then you upgrade to the business critical, which is what I mentioned in my presentation. And as you can see here, the business critical package offers AWS private link support, and it also offers Azure private link support. So again, that's further support to link these iCloud accounts. And then moving on, you have the virtual private Snowflake. So that's the VPS, which of course includes all of the contents of the prior packages plus a customer dedicated virtual server. So it seems these packages cater to a number of business needs. And I'm sure if you're a small business starting out, you might want to start with the standard package. And of course, the more data you collect from your users, your customers, then you might need to upgrade to the enterprise package. And then of course, it seems like the business critical, if I was a large business, I would probably go with business critical. But again, it does cater to a variety of business needs, which of course will be priced differently. And I'm sure if you are in the standard or the enterprise package, like most packages, there's always an incentive to upgrade. So I think it's quite good that they do have this type of variety. Okay, so back to the presentation. So now we have a really great understanding of the variety of packages that they offer their customers. So what type of customer would actually need or use Snowflake? And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about Google. So if you think about Google, for example, they have hundreds, thousands, millions of data points regarding its users, you know, from where they travel. Of course, you have the Google Maps, which pretty much tracks your location to what they watch. Again, Google owns YouTube, so they know exactly what you're watching. To who you even contact, again, you have the Gmail account, okay? So Google gathers all of this data regarding each and every one of its users, and Snowflake will collate and store all that data, as well as provide Google with the tools to seamlessly access and analyze that information, okay? Analyze that data. And again, based on the data that they analyze from the user's activity, they can then target specific types of ads to boost your revenues. That's all it's really about, you know, and that of course, because the ads are targeted towards you as a, an individual based on the data they've collected from you, you're more likely to then purchase the products from the ads. So again, that will help boost Google's revenue. And I hope that made sense. That's really one of the big examples that I figured most people would be able to understand. So you can start to see the the impact snowflake has on these large corporations and we will go into their customer base shortly but one thing i do want to point out is that you have large companies like apple that are even hiring engineers to work specifically <laughs> to work specifically on their snowflake data warehouse platform and again that's due to the millions of user data that apple collects through their apple devices so if you think about it if you have the iphone if you use their their macbooks if you have an ipad if you have the apple watch all of this information as much as they are of course helping you they are gathering data 
about you, okay? And Apple are now actually recruiting engineers to come in to use their Snowflake platforms to do more detailed analysis. Let's take a look at the job role. So as you can see here, it's jobs at Apple and they need a Snowflake engineer. So if you are a Snowflake engineer or you work on Snowflake and you're looking for a job with Apple, then you're welcome. That's all I can say. <laughs> you are welcome indeed. But I think it's quite amazing that a large company like Apple and with all of their resources, they still need an engineer to come in. So you can see here, one of the key qualifications is experience in Snowflake performance tuning, capacity planning, handling cloud spend, and utilization is a plus, okay? And they've got here that you need to have strong expertise in AWS, so that's Amazon's cloud-based system, specifically to in compute, storage, and security services. So again, these are the qualifications you need to have for this job role. Um, I have never used Snowflake, um, so yeah, I'm not a candidate for this. I might just submit my CV just for banter, <laughs> but yeah, that's the job role. And this is Apple, one of the largest companies in the world with a 2 trillion market cap are also hiring engineers to use their Snowflake platform. It's crazy. Okay, so now we have a more detailed understanding of the story of Snowflake how they work, the products and the services and the different packages that they provide their customers and also why customers would actually use Snowflake. The next question is how does Snowflake generate its revenue, okay? Of course, I did show you the four packages that they offer their clients, but the majority of their revenue does come from three separate streams, okay? And this is their storage resources stream. They also have the compute resources stream and thirdly, they have the data transfer resources stream. And if you are following along using the, the SEC filings form, it's on page 52. And I'm going to take you to it now. So I've highlighted it here on page 52 and they have gone into more detail. So it says, we generate the substantial majority of our revenue from fees charged to our customers based on the storage, compute and data transfer resources consumed on our platform as a single integrated offering. For storage resources, consumption fees are based on the average terabytes per month of all the customer's data stored in our platform. For the compute resources, which is the compute resources stream, consumption fees are based on the type of compute resources used and the duration of use or for some features, the volume of data processed. And for the data transfer resources streams, consumption fees are based on terabytes of data transferred, public cloud provider used, and the region to and from which the transfer is executed. And again, that's on page 52 in the section management discussion and analysis of financial conditions and results of operations. So now that we are on how they generate their revenue, I think this is a great segue into taking a look at the company's financials. And again, if you are following along, that is on page 54. Now, so we are on the fiscal year ended, which is January 31st. And here we have their product revenue. They have their remaining performance obligations. Remember investors, these are all in millions, okay? They have uh, information regarding their total customers, also their net revenue retention and customers with a trailing 12 month product revenue greater than 1 million. Okay, so let's review their product revenue. So as you can see in 2019, their product revenue had generated $95 million. Okay, and if you look at the fiscal year ending 2020, look at that, it's more than tripled. Their product revenue is sitting at 252 million. So they've gone from 95 million in 2019, fiscal year ending January 31st, to 2022, which is $252 million. And I apologize, guys, it isn't triple, but it's close to triple. If they were to triple this, it would have been 287 million. But I mean, that's way more than double. And they are close to tripling their product revenue at this amount, which is insane. And if you look at their remaining performance obligations in millions, again, that has more than tripled actually, because that's sitting at 128 million versus 2020, which is sitting at 426.3 
million. That's insane growth. Now let's take a look at their total customers and therein lies the secret for their incredible growth. So now the fiscal year that ended in January 31st, 2019, that a total of 948 customers. But let's fast forward to fiscal year ending 2020 <laughs> and their total customers are 2,392. Amazing. Again, that has more than doubled close to tripled their amount of total customers. Their net revenue retention rate is down. It's gone from 180% to 169%, but their total customers with a trailing 12 month product revenue that's greater than a million has gone from 14 to 41. Incredible. And even if you transfer over to six months ended in July 31st, again, their total product revenue has more than doubled. It's at 100 million here in 2019 to July 31st, which is sitting at 227 million. The remaining performance obligation again more than tripled from 221 million to 688 million and their total customers nearly doubled in from 2019 July to the 31st of July 2020 sitting at 3117 total customers so as an investor I'm looking at this and I'm like man this company is growing at rapid speed also as an investor, I'm thinking, how are they able to grow their product revenue? How are they able to grow their total customers? Pretty much doubling their total customers within a six months period. And the answer, I think, lies in their income statement. So I'm going to take you to the income statement right now. So we're on the income statement for the fiscal year ended January 31st and also the six months ended in July 31st. Again, you can take a look at their total revenue was at 96 million and their revenue in 2020 sitting at 264 million. All right. The cost of revenue back in 2019 was sitting at 51 million and their cost of revenue for 2020 did more than double, which is sitting at 116 million. Okay. Now their gross profit, of course, did double because they did pretty much double their revenue. So whatever they spent on the cost of revenue was efficient because again, it affected their top line. But their gross profit in 2019 fiscal year ended January 31st was 44 million. And their gross profit for 2020 was sitting at 148 million. Now, how were they able to grow their customer base? Look at the amount of money they've spent on sales and marketing. It's an alarming amount of money. They spent 125 million dollars for sales and marketing in 2019 and if you fast forward to 2020 they pretty much more than doubled that in 2020 they spent 293 million on sales and marketing now think about it guys they only made a gross profit of 148 million but yet they've spent 293 million on sales and marketing they're also spending a lot of money in research and development. They've gone from 68 million in 2019 to 105 million. And even if we scoot over to the six months ended in July 31st, a gross profit was 51 million. But again, they spent 137 million on sales and marketing. For 2020, their gross profit was 148 million. But again, they spent a lot more than they actually made on sales and marketing, which sat at 190 million. So how are these guys doubling, tripling their customers. They're spending a lot more on sales and marketing than they're actually generating in gross profit. And of course, that affects the bottom line. It's resulted in a net loss of 178 million in 2019 and also 348 million in 2020. Again, that's fiscal year ended January 31st. And if you screw over to 2020 is 177 million versus 171 million in 2020. So whatever they're doing for their sales and marketing, it is obviously working because they are growing their customer base, which is a plus. But it is a little bit concerning that they are spending more on sales and marketing than that than they are actually generating. Because even take a look at this, guys. I just actually realized as I was talking, they spent 293 million right on sales and marketing but their revenue that they actually generated was 264 million. 
So they actually spent a lot more money than they forget gross profit. They actually spent a lot more money on, on sales and marketing than they actually generated as revenue. That is an insane amount of sales and marketing. And ah, that's a bit of a risk. I have to be honest. For me as an investor, that is a bit of a risk. But it is paying off because they are growing and they are growing at a tremendous rate. Right, so moving on to their balance sheet, because again, we wanna know, is this company gonna go bankrupt anytime soon or do they have a solid balance sheet? And I do love the balance sheet. Taking a look at their cash position, cash and cash equivalents in 2019 was sitting at 116 million, okay, versus 2020, which is now up to 127 million, which is also a great sign of growth if they are improving their cash position and even into July 2020, their cash position has also further improved, sitting at $138 million, okay? So taking a look at their total current assets because that will give me an indication as to whether they have enough total current assets to fulfill their total current liabilities, which is, of course, their financial obligations within the next 12 months. And the first thing I will say is that their total current assets has actually gone in the opposite direction to everything else, okay? So their total current assets at 2019, January 31st, was sitting at 698 million, and it actually went down to 665 million in January 2020. But the plus is that in July 31st, 2020, they did go back up to 793 million, okay? So, and that's reassuring because if you take a look at their total current liabilities, the total current liabilities has also gone up. In 2019, it was sitting at 144 million versus January 2020, it had increased to 416 million. And, and on the 31st of July, their total current liabilities was sitting at 477 million. But versus a total current assets, or 793 million, I can confidently say that they do have a current ratio which is above one. So let's quickly do the math actually, and it's pretty easy. So you have the total current assets, which is sitting at 793 million. And if you divide it by the total current liabilities, which is 373 million, that will give you a current ratio of just above two. So that's really, really impressive because if you've watched any of my previous videos, I love to invest in companies that have a current ratio that is above one because that's an indicator that the company are able to fulfill their financial obligations within the next 12 months. Again, another healthy sign is that their total assets, which in July 2020 was sitting at 1.4 billion versus their total liabilities, which is sitting at 673 million. Okay, so I think this company does have a solid balance sheet in my opinion their total current assets are now finally going in the right way also their cash and cash equivalents is also heading in the correct direction they do have a solid current ratio and i just really like this balance sheet i really really do like this balance sheet so that is their financials i hope you enjoyed that section again it's on page 54 so do your own due diligence so now we have a great idea of their financials. I do think they have a solid balance sheet. We have found their secret to their revenue growth, which of course is in their sales and marketing, which they have actually gone ham on. So now let's take a look at their customers and also their main competitors, because we need to know who their competitors are to determine whether they have a strong enough moat, okay? So Snowflake actually boasts some big industry leading names as their customers. And to find that out, I went on their website and I challenge you to see where you can spot any popular names. You know, you have Lionsgate. Again, I recognize this logo anywhere. They have Adobe, the University of Notre Dame. Can't lie, I don't really know who these guys are, <laughs> but it sounds really cool. They also have Capital One, which is in the financial sector. They have Deliveroo as their customers. They have Sony. Wow, Sony Pictures one of their customers they have DocuSign look at this guys they have the bad boy they have Square you know I love Square even though I sold out of the stock but I do love Square but they have Square as a customer which other name do I recognize they have Logitech again Logitech games they have DoorDash wow they actually have DoorDash that's incredible and and yeah you can see they do have a variety of big names in their 
portfolio, okay? So remember that their customer base has grown and I did show you in my presentation earlier, but they do boast some incredible names as customers. With that said, their main and biggest competitors in this field are ironically also their partners. Because remember, Snowflake operates across multiple cloud providing platforms. So with that said, Let's take a look at their main competition as well as their partners. So it says here that Snowflake is available on AWS, Microsoft Azure and Google in countries in North America, Europe, Asia Pacific and Japan. It reads here that our cloud data platform was first available on Amazon's AWS, which remains an integral Snowflake partner with which we have many joint customers. And they're also available on the Microsoft Azure platform. So again, customers that may have cloud storage with Microsoft Azure and also AWS will be able to link their data, okay, between both platforms. And in early 2020, they did jump on board with Google Cloud, yet again responding to our customers by offering Snowflake on Google I mean, these are the three biggest names in the cloud storage space. You have to be honest. I mean, I can't really think of any more. I mean, yes, you have Dropbox, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud are pretty much the three front runners. And Snowflake do have these three as their partners, which I think is incredible. But the problem is Amazon's AWS has another product called Amazon Redshift, which does exactly what Snowflake does. It's also a data cloud warehouse. Let me take you to their Redshift website. And I find this incredibly interesting because look, Amazon's Redshift here, like I said to you at the beginning, Snowflake is a cloud data warehouse. And Amazon's Redshift is claiming to be the most popular and the fastest cloud data warehouse. And they are also already building up a strong customer base. They have Yelp, they have Comcast, they have Lyft, they have Equinox. They have Dow Jones. They also have McDonald's and Pfizer. So it's interesting that Amazon AWS will allow Snowflake to operate. But in the background, you've got Jeff, of course, as he does, is now building his own platform, which is called Redshift. Uh, this is quite alarming. I can't lie. And it also proves a big risk to Snowflake's business model. And Amazon's Redshift are also building up their partner network. So I think... In terms of competition, Amazon's Redshift is probably Snowflake's biggest competitor right now because they have a platform that does exactly what Snowflake does. So do I think Snowflake have a strong enough moat? I think the answer to that question is yes, but it does make the hairs of my neck stand up to see that Amazon Redshift are offering a data cloud warehouse. And if you look at Amazon's track record, these guys are, are bullies. They will undercut you if they have to, to get you out of business. You know, Amazon are savages. So that is a bit worrying. As a potential Snowflake investor, that does cause a bit of concern towards Snowflake's moats. So now we understand Snowflake, we understand the company profile, the products and the services that it provides, what type of clients and customers that they have, how they generate their incredible revenue, which of course we've identified is from their massive budget on sales and marketing. The question now remains, is Snowflake a buy at the IPO? I personally do love and understand Snowflake, um, but something happened recently that I wasn't too impressed about. So their initial public offering was set to be priced at between $75 to $85 a share, but they have recently raised that to $100 to $110 a share. So CNBC covered this and said Snowflake raised its estimated IPO price by around 30% in a new S1 filing on Monday. The company now expects to go public at a share price of, a of between $100 to $110 a share, according to the filing. It had previously said that shares would likely debut between $75 to $85. I don't know about you guys, but this is an indicator that there is some strong demand for snowflake shares for them to actually bump up the price by 30 percent before ipo date that's incredible and of course if anything's going to boost your confidence as a company it's when you have berkshire hathaway and salesforce which is a company that i also own have agreed to buy 250 millions worth of stock at the ipo price in a concurrent private placement now that they've bumped up their prices the question is is snowflake a buy at its ipo and for me, personally, 
my decision is yes. And the way I plan to invest is I've set aside a maximum budget for Snowflake and I plan to deploy about 70% of that budget into Snowflake at the IPO. And if the price drops under $100, then I do plan to load up with another 15% of my budget with more Snowflake shares. And if it drops under $80 a share, which I strongly doubt it, then I would deploy the rest of the 15% and hold. So that is my plan for Snowflake at the IPO. Remember investors, please do your own due diligence before you decide to invest in any company or any stock. This is just my research. I am not a financial advisor, so please see this as educational. But if you do want to learn more about how to invest in stocks and also how to do more research, there are links in the description below that will help you with that. And if you do want to decide to invest in any companies, my broker Trading212 will give us both a free share if you decide to set up an account using the link in the description below. Once again, please smash the like button if you gained any value from today's video. If you do want to see more content from myself, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell for more stock analysis and research. Thank you so much for spending your time and watching my video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.